So we are ready to start. And this is Tom the Vatering, Tom van the Vatering, right? Yep. It's correct, yep. this uh, right. That's name, right? Yep. And uh, so we are right to start at the, on the dot of 10 o'clock, like a Swiss train. Uh, we start this series of talk of today. And we have the, as a first speaker, we have Tom van der Wetering from HKU Utrecht. Um, and uh, Tom is part of the uh, Expertise Center for Artistic Entrepreneurship of uh, HKU Utrecht. And um, we invited Tom because uh, artistic entrepreneurship is one of the focus uh, and the uh, issues of the work package four of you for our differences which has organized this series of talks. So uh, we are here in the Casa Spirituale San Silvestro in Monte Compatri, and some of you are online. So as always, we have these two groups. And uh, if you have to want to place after the speech of uh, Tom, uh, some question to Tom, you can either use the chat or uh, just um, activate your microphone, camera and uh, and uh, ask Tom, uh, uh, place Tom a question. Uh, Tom is uh, uh, just brief if you introduce him. Um, he works uh, as a program manager of HKUX that he will now explain maybe what it is, um, which is uh, the entrepreneurship and talent program of HKU. And he's also a lecturer within the faculty of, of HQR, HKU Arts and Economics and teaches about creative business models, strategy design, and funding. Um, the HKU Expertise Center for Creative Entrepreneurships helps students, alumni, and lecturers to develop as entrepreneurs by stimulating their capacity for creative change, their strategic insight, and their active enterprising attitude. So, Tom, I think I'll leave you the floor, and please, so are you seeing my slides right now? Yes. Multiplying potential with creative AI, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, perfect. So I'll get started. Um, yeah, thanks for, for inviting me to talk about um, entrepreneurship and um, uh, and a, a crossover with, uh, with technology. Uh, a little bit of, about myself. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I um, will talk about entrepreneurship and Digital Culture today, uh, which is also one of the teams of your uh, program. Um, and that's also my background. So if I, I have an MA in New Media and Digital Culture, Utrecht University. And after graduating, I started as a creative entrepreneur myself and then um, went to HKU, uh, Utrecht University of the Arts, um, to teach at the Arts and Economic Department um, and to set up a pre-incubator, a community of creative entrepreneurs uh, that are just at the start of their careers. So um, our students um, finalize their, their studies. Uh, they are really focused on the artistic processes. They are trying to develop themselves and to invent themselves as uh, creatives, as artists. Um, and um, then they graduate and then they have to move to their next step. And that can be, can be very tough. So they don't have a network yet. They need to find ways to not be uh, only uh, valuable for, uh, for society or for, uh, for a museum or for an exposition, for example, um, but they have to make money too. They have to earn an income. And they experience a lot of um, questions, a lot of struggles in that first phase after graduating. Um, so we designed a program for that for that group, um, an interdisciplinary program. So it's not focused on one of the disciplines, but on the broad range of disciplines uh, that are active at, at HKU. Uh, it's a very broad art school. Um, it's, um, uh, it's one of the largest art schools uh, of Europe. Um, and we have disciplines ranging from theater to illustrations, to product design, to game developments, to um, uh, musicians um, and uh, uh, music and technology. 
Um, so every, maybe even every discipline except for, for dance. We don't offer dance in our programs, but all other uh, creative disciplines are, um, uh, are, are educated at, um, at HKU. Um, and there happens a lot when they, they come together. So what we're trying to do in that program is that we um, try to form teams, um, interdisciplinary teams. So in the example you see in the picture, you uh, find uh, someone who studied uh, social design. Um, the, the girl on the left studied uh, spatial design, interior architecture. Um, so she was used to building things in public sp in spaces, public space and interior space. And on the right, um, an illustrator who made uh, 2D images and illustrations. So we brought them together and we matched them with uh, external potential clients. In this case, uh, the Dutch Central Bank, who wanted to um, make some form of an artwork to connect with their surrounding um, neighborhood and to invite people in their neighborhood to experience what the Dutch Central Bank can mean for them as a community. Um, and our role was to, to, to make that match, uh, to guide the process, um, to um, have some contact with both the, uh, the designers and the uh, clients um, and um, yeah, to, to follow and learn from what happens when um, these this makers in the start of their career um, work together maybe for the first time in such an interdisciplinary team and for such a big client and sometimes um, uh, hard client as uh, the Dutch uh, central bank um, so we just started last friday with a new community of 30 um, just recently uh, graduated alumni um, and we offer them some workshops we bring them together for network events and we try to match them with uh, with clients um, but besides that i'm also starting uh, a research project as part of the creative entrepreneurship research group uh, that just started last year um, and you know we're looking to uh, we're, we're trying to, to to look a bit forward um, and find some research topics that uh, be, that are becoming relevant for our students in the next couple of years um, and one of them is uh, generative AI, and that's the topic that I'd, I'd like to talk about today. Um, that is, I think, uh, really interesting um, in regards to your um, to the topic of your whole, whole program, uh, and that has some relationship with uh, entrepreneurship uh, as well. Because what happens when this kind of installations, illustrations, uh, maybe even movies uh, and other uh, image-based uh, media um, aren't no longer designed by creative professionals that we educate and maybe not even by amateurs who uh, put a lot of hours um, as hobbyists in their creative work, um, but by robots or machines. So the picture you see on the left is generated just a couple of minutes ago um, by an AI. Uh, and the only thing I had to do was putting the caption of the previous image. Um, so a photograph of an art installation about team growth um, made by an illustrator and a spatial designer or a sculpture designer. Um, and I could also uh, even add the location of the installation to um, to what I wanted to to see from um, uh, from the image generator. So I could also say it would it, it should be located in a park in Amsterdam. Um, and this was one of one of the results. Maybe not that realistic or beautiful or um, uh, interesting, but I think it's a it's a nice first uh, try for just a couple of seconds or minutes um, creative work so for me it's 
it's especially interesting. It's it got my interest because I've never been a maker or image maker or artist myself. So I have a, an academic background, and sometimes I miss the opportunity to to make images. So I'm not a real Photoshopper, for example, or a, uh, a user of Illustrator or a hobbyist when it comes to uh, artistic practices. I'm just helping students who, who have this, those capabilities uh, with becoming more entrepreneurial. So I try to um, share my knowledge of culture and business um, with those makers. But what happens when I, as a, uh, as, as a non-artist, can make works of art too? And can, they, can those works be considered uh, art? Or can the students we educate do something unique or add some other value to uh, in the age of this generative AI? So I call it generative AI. Um, some people, it's just a, a new tool, new uh, development, and I think the field is still looking for the perfect term. Um, but I think generative AI or generative image AI um, is is a term that uh, that is very usable for for the moment. So GAI um, in short. Um, so. What will be the, the theme of this talk? I will, and also the, the theme of my upcoming uh, research project. Um, we will dive into the emergence of uh, generative AI, uh, how it impacts the value packages of creative professionals. Uh, so we discovered when we were talking with just graduated students that they still have to be aware of what their value is uh, and uh, the whole package of values they represent, and uh, um, the whole package of values they can they can sell or lease to to potential clients. And I my hypothesis is that uh, those value packages might change in the age of generative AI. So that could be an interesting sub team to um, to explore. Um, and of course, what this means for our position as an art school. So should we integrate those um, those new tools and uh, machine made um, images and artworks into the curriculum or should we focus on um, values that cannot be replaced or that cannot be easily replaced by uh, by everyday people and everyday machines? So let's start with maybe some core principles. We're talking about image making and just in a very um, basic sense, um, that's always about um, catching, catching uh, a part of reality, make it durable. Um, it's in a lot of times, it's about making stories durable or um, having a medium to tell stories. Uh, it's about artistic expression, of course. So you make an image to, um, if because you want to make an, a work of art, for example. Um, it's and, and you can uh, place your artisticity into that image. It's also about, and it has always been about, also in the in the age of um, uh, in the age before photographs, for example, and before what we now consider technology, uh, about crafting and tinkering with technology or uh, types of um, tools and, uh, uh, and media. So Rembrandt, Rembrandt was famous for um, exploring the painting process as a, a form of, of technology and really um, moving to the boundaries of what was possible with uh, paint, for example. Um, and uh, even in the uh, pre-modern um, uh, age, it was about some forms of alchemy um, and discovery or science. So uh, many artists use a uh, sort of scientific approach to be really innovative and to, to um, 
uh, discover new qualities of paint, for example. So it was about play, the crafting uh, part, but also about um, really investigating the materials they worked with. And maybe also very important, uh, especially when we consider Rembrandt, for example. Um, so you, you weren't, as an artist, only making images because you, you wanted to do it for yourself or to express your own view on the world, but in many cases you did it for clients or for other makers um, in collaboration. Um, so it wasn't always purely artistic um, uh, because you, you wanted to express yourself. It was also uh, about expressing um, something for, um, for others who paid you and you could make a living by making that art. Uh, and I think when we talk about the, um, uh, the creative entrepreneurship part um, and the added value part of, um, uh, of artists working with, uh, with computers or without computers and adding value to the world and making a living of that added value, uh, it's important to consider that too. So, the clients need to see your uh, added value too, or they won't give you um, their money or an, an interesting appointment. So that history of capturing images is long. So you can see the pa paintings as, um, uh, as image machines, um, or uh, you could see it as media, of, uh, uh, of course. Um, but then um, we saw the emergence of the, uh, you know, the revolution or evolution of photography. So photography changed that they made um, images uh, durable, um, uh, but it took a while before that happened. So if you look at that history, it's take, uh, it took a couple of decades um, from the uh, 18th century to till the um, 19th century um, to move from the first experiments with capturing light onto um, something that could be called photography till uh, in 1839 uh, the first really practical uh, forms of photography where it didn't uh, took several days of exposure so it was uh, made practical um, to, to take a photograph and to capture something on an image. Um, and maybe we can consider that as the, um, the birth of practical photography. Um, and I think that has some parallels with the emergence of uh, generative AI. Uh, but then it took a while and now it's happening very, very fast. Um, and on the, the other image, you see the emergence of another important technology, printing. Um, and that was a, a whole set of innovations um, that finally led to the invention of digital printing. So there happened a lot in the field, but there was, still, was in most cases, um, uh, a couple of years between every big innovation. So then another important short history, the history of computer art. Um, and that's about whether this is something new or, hap or um, happened before or was uh, uh, already available um, for a couple of decades. So in that case, when we look at generative AI as machine-made art, um, it isn't that new. So even when the first computers were designed in the 1950s, uh, scientists made art with it. Um, they didn't do that just because they wanted to be an artist, um, but it was very useful for scientific purposes to test the limits of, um, of the machines, for example, and to um, speculate about what can be done with those machines in the future. In the future, but of course the machines were very expensive, just like the first neural nets, uh, the the artificial intelligence that was used to uh, 
to generate AI was very expensive in the beginning of that, um, that invention. Um, and we had some first experiments with machine generated R2. And then um, I think we can make some parallels, not with the technique, but more with how we should consider um, computer generated or machine generated artworks, art or creative. Um, and there has a lot been said about that in the, in the past by philosophers who um, investigated uh, the early machine generated artworks. So this is a work by Jean Tingli, um, and um, it's a machine that that generates uh, an, or the, that draws an image on a piece of paper. And then we have to ask ourselves, what is considered the artwork here? So is it the um, the end result? Is it um, um, the pencil on the on the paper? Is it that image that is considered the artwork? Or is the machine and the whole um, installation considered the artwork? And I think we will all agree it would be uh, the latter. So the, um, uh, just the image isn't that, that interesting. Um, it's, it's just maybe considered by many people as, as child's work. Um, but making a machine that generates an image can be considered an interesting view into the future or an interesting critique on what machines can and cannot do. So that can be considered an artwork. Um, and it also means that machines can be creative. So the way in which they are creative depends, uh, or you can have critique on that. But many, um, uh, many academics agree that uh, machines uh, are creative in, in many cases. Um, so, and maybe machines have always been uh, creative. So then um, a little bit further, um, it uh, went into uh, making art that really um, critiqued or reflected on previous uh, analog works of art. Uh, two examples, um, Michael Knoll, um, they, he generated a, um, a pattern that was inspired by uh, the work of Mondrian. And the same was done multiple decades later um, in an art competition I contributed to. It was the Victory Bookie Wookie competition by uh, Media Lab Setup. It's a Utrecht-based Media Lab. And they set out a competition to, um, uh, to ask programmers to um, be inspired by the Victory Bookie Wookie by Mondrian and to design an elegant algorithm that could reflect on that image or that could generate that image. And you saw the same thing as the example of the machine generated art. So it wasn't the end result that matters. Um, so it's, it's when you just use paint, for example, or another simple painting or computer painting technology, it is very simple to just um, uh, make a copy of uh, um, of the Victory Boogie Wookie. So it's not about replicating, but it is about making a machine that um, imitates or that reflects on the artistic processes. Um, and the machine becomes the artwork. So that's still a, a niche uh, among uh, artists and computer artists to make those um, artistic machines and to uh, present at work at um, at art shows, etc. Um, so that's also not not very new. It is not new to make art with uh, machines, and it's also not new to make digital images. So um, it was discovered that Andy Warhol uh, was one of the first who did so. So he used a uh, a game console, the Commodore. Um, to create uh, a, an imitation of one of his uh, famous works with a computer. 
uh, very simple work, but um, also uh, very uh, futuristic for that time because he showed that uh, it wasn't that hard to create artworks or images with uh, with computers, which was a big deal back then. Um, and he stored it on a on a floppy disk. Um, and uh, then a, a more technological breakthrough was needed to to move from that niche and niche artist who used machines to make creative work um, to consider um, computers as creative tools for the people or for a broad audience of a broad uh, spectrum of uh, of hobbyists and professional makers. Um, and that was, of course, the introduction of the uh, graphical user interface, the GUI, um, um, by, uh, by Apple, for example, um, and the introduction of sophisticated software to make and um, redesign and edit images, uh, Photoshop, for example, uh, which was introduced in, um, in 1990. Um, and so what happened back then is that the, the art of and the, the process of making images with computers uh, transformed from a prompt based approach. So uh, back in the days without the graphical user interface, you had to uh, put in the prompts into the computer, you have to program to generate an image. Uh, that was the only way. There wasn't a visual interface where you could just click um, and and draw on the screen. Um, and the Apple One and Photoshop, that kind of technologies, changed that into a um, graphical interface, and um, and and that made it a creative tool for many more people. It was more usable, and you didn't even have to read to become. Um, uh, or to use that um, that interfaces, you could just watch and uh, click on the um, on the icons and draw something. So uh, it really made computers a creative tool for the people, and they um, uh, it, it looked like prompt based image making uh, was something of the past. Then another important trend, um, the first photo on the World Wide Web. Uh, this was the first photo. I don't know why, why they picked that one. Maybe it was some kind of a joke um, or they just wanted to put, uh, put this one online. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, uh, did it himself. He put an image on the web and that uh, was the start of the World Wide Web transform transforming from only a text-based library to an image-based library, um, where you could not only search for, for articles and for, for books or for text, etc., um, uh, textual knowledge, uh, but you could also use nowadays uh, Google Images, for example, to really uh, rapidly find the image you are looking for. Um, and I think maybe even this presentation, this presentation was very hard to accompany with, uh, uh, with, with examples and uh, images without this technology. So it makes it much faster to, um, to, to, to make something new based on image images. So, and that's, Trend continued to accelerate. So the early days, the uh, 90s, aren't even uh, visible. It would be a line we couldn't even see in this graph. Uh, so it accelerates very quickly to over 100 billion images a year. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's growing uh, exponentially. Um, and that was also the reason why this new kind of technologies could be um, developed. So some preliminary conclusions about the history of those technologies that are probably relevant for 
um, the way we look at those those new tools and the ways um, this will impact the the processes and the um, practices of creative professionals uh, and maybe even the way they can still make money um, so there's a lot of parallels with um, the uh, the history of photography for example the history of printing um, not only because it was about image making but it was also always it has always been about technology about finding the right medium to express yourself um, and to discover new things so, so it was also always about innovating and the innovation itself um, is part of the artistic process so the artists themselves are were always making new discoveries and they added to the scientific field in that sense and vice versa so I think that's that's very interesting that um, and that playing with those new technologies uh, allows you not to only use that technology but also invent new ways of um, moving that technology forward um, so that's also why many of those tools start as a niche um, among the professional artists, the real innovators, and the scientific community. Um, but after a while, those technologies change into usable tools for the masses. That is in many cases the, the big, the holy grail of, um, uh, yeah, of, of innovating those uh, technologies. So with photography, it took a while, but um, new technologies develop much quicker um, and reach the practical uses use cases a lot uh, sooner um, and that also allows the, to reach not only the mathematics and uh, computer science communities but also other scientific communities as well that maybe aren't that into developing programming langu languages for example um, and then uh, we had a, uh, a status quo in the 2010s. So we had a gigantic image data set of, of billions of images uh, available online. So they could be scraped from, from in the internet. So a big collection, a library, a mega library of images. And there was something new invented, neural nets. Um, there is a, a, another way of programming that differs from how um, things like the victory boogie woogie etc were um, imagined with computer code um, and they functioned a lot more like the or, or, I, or I, uh, a brain of a human would function so that combination of very very large image data sets of all kind of images, uh, historic images, uh, images of all paintings ever created, uh, images of um, just the last year of all digital images created by hobbyists and creative professionals put on Instagram, for example, uh, that combined with that new technology neural nets um, was, uh, was the starting point of that next step. Um, and of the advent of generative AI. So the history of generative AI is it builds forth on the previous technologies, but it is also a technology that accelerates very quickly. Um, so what was the goal of generative AI or what seems to be the, the goal? Um, this is an interesting one because we just saw that the goal of the, uh, the not the uh, GAI, but uh, JUI, the GUI, the graphical user interface was um, moving from prompt based to uh, visual based. Um, and this transforms visual based back into prompt based. So, well, it, seemed to be easier to, to make images with um, things that really re resemble um, the, the, the things you use in your daily life as a uh, analog painter, for example. So you can use a brush in Photoshop 
um, it looks like your your process you're familiar with as an artist. Now um, uh, they try to make it even more accessible also for not artists. So if you're not used to using a pen or a pencil or a, uh, a brush, uh, then you can um, then you're not excluded of making uh, artworks anymore. So you just need to uh, know basic text. Just a simple prompt um, can help you make uh, uh, make an artwork. So that was the goal. Um, so how did that happen? Uh, Deep Dream uh, was one of the starting points. Um, it was a scientific project by um, Google AI and and they did uh, while doing that that research they did in discovery so so the algorithms the computers were very good in trying to uh, understand images trying to understand if something is a cat or a dog for example um, but then they discovered that algorithms that were very good at that the neural nets that were very good at um, discriminating between cats and dogs, for example, we're also um, having some capabilities of generating those images too. So that was a discovery that um, uh, that, that brought the field a bit forward, but it wasn't very practical yet. So it became a little bit more practical in 2019, just a couple of years ago. Um, then we had the Stel GAN um, technology, and that was able to generate faces, for example. Not the most photorealistic faces, and you, in most of the cases, you had to input an existing photo, and it can, could transform that photo into another style. Um, so it was still a scientific experiment, and not able to generate um, a very photorealistic photo just from some text. Um, but uh, it was also um, put to productive use in camera filters, uh, for example, or filters on Snapchat and, and Instagram. Uh, <laughs> um, and then what happened was the, the, the real breakthrough. Um, Dolly won. Um, it wasn't science or theory anymore, so it uh, led to some usable results. So that was the first time we thought, uh, we talked about generative AI as something that maybe could in the future replace some of the creative work done by, by humans. Um, and it, it was some kind of a little bit productive already. So we tried to imagine some, uh, some furniture. For so we wanted to mix it with some avocado style. This is some it generated some interesting results you could build on uh, with, uh, with, um, with your own imagination. So for product designers, for example, to switch off his yeah, webcam. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but the resolution was still very low, um, and it was only um, developed by OpenAI, and it was closed source, so it was a little bit secretive. And then only a year later, the next version came out, and then well, that was the moment that um, generative AI became uh, very practical. So the first practical AI, maybe, maybe not analogous to the uh, uh, photography invention that was made practical in the 1886 year. So Cosmopolitan and some other magazines made covers with it. So this was a, um, an astronaut generated with um, uh, with just a prompt. Took only 20 seconds to make, um, and yeah, that was maybe the first time they replaced an, a real human artist with that kind of um, machines. Um, but it was still a little bit secretive, so this was just a couple of months ago, and we're now in July, and Mid Journey came into uh, fruition. So it was a competitor to, to OpenAI, and what they did was they uh, opened it um, and run it via a Discord community, which means that all artists 
um, that were making artworks could see what artists were doing and they were really helping each other. So there was a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning involved. It maybe even felt like, an, uh, also for me, the first time I um, I was part of that uh, that commu community to to generate my own images and to look what others were doing. It was like you're um, just learning in an art school, or you were just learning in a uh, working in a creative um, community. Um, working together with others, being inspired by others and making so and sharing some work for yourself. So that was an open culture, but it was still not open source. So you couldn't take the technology and um, make something other with it. Uh, and it had a paid membership. So it was also an, uh, maybe um, not fully open and scientific um, way of working but you had to pay something which excluded some others as well and then just a couple of weeks ago stable diffusion was launched and maybe this is the real breakthrough for the generative ai scene not because this ai is definitely better than dolly and midjourney um, so the images it generates are comparable um, but the uh, code is open source so they just uh, made it available to download and everyone can take this code and run it even on their own com computers. So you don't need a very expensive computer or um, server park to run uh, this experiment. Um, and everyone, every computer programmer or enthusiastic artist can make them, their own um, innovations on top of this uh, technology. So in just a couple of days and weeks, uh, many variants and many improvements were um, developed, not by the company that developed this technology, but by the whole community of people that uh, embrace this technology and try to um, make something new with it. So it's now really among the masses to use this technology and it's accelerating very quickly. So just a, a short overview. So we had the creepy dogs. It was just scientific. Then creepy faces in 2019. Uh, in 21, the first glimpses of productive AI, um, generative AI. Um, then a couple of months ago in April, uh, the first headlines will Delhi take over my creative job um, or should we close the art schools? Um, and then it became a really creative community and now just a couple of weeks ago it's um, already made it to not only a new technology um, owned by some big corporations but by but something a tool that everyone can can use everyone can use to to create images and that we will see in um in Google, for example, so you're not searching for um, uh, for something that already exists, but you generate something with uh, search machines like Google. Um, maybe in your uh, WhatsApp or other communication tools, so you want to send a picture. No, you don't use an access existing picture, but you generate a picture. They think that kind of things will uh, accelerate very quickly. Um, and we have to imagine what is the next thing so if this uh, accelerates this quickly so how will uh, 26 look like when the current uh, new students will will graduate so that's i think that is for art schools the way of thinking about this technology thinking ahead and trying to imagine uh, what we should do now to uh, give the students that will graduate in a couple of years um, to to make sure they have a good uh, profitable uh, future. So what could this mean for us? Um, I think it's it's maybe a good reminder to um, tell you a little bit about the, the specific context of our art school. I think for the fine art um, art schools, so the, the art institutions that are really developing the fine art students that uh, have the ambition to, um, to be very independent and autonomous art artists, 
maybe they just embrace this as a new technology and they aren't that dependent on being hired by clients, for example. And they will try to find a way to to stay artistic and to to um, to be different from um, the what amateurs are making with this technology. Um, but we have a very broad art school and it's not only about making fine art and autonomous art, but also about um, more functional design or applied design. Um, and I think it's important that we always see technology as a tool you can use uh, to make art and a tool you have to um, incorporate in your practice to stay ahead of the field. Um, and a tool that makes possible new kinds of working. Um, and we also embrace new crossover disciplines like arts and economics, um, connecting uh, economic students to artists, uh, crossover creativity, connecting artists to fields like healthcare, um, uh, um, uh, ecological topics, um, and social design, for example. Um, and we are always looking at what can be your role uh, as an artist within society. So not only making art because you want to make art, but also what can be your impact on society. So let's move quickly to a couple of examples of how these technologies can be used uh, or yeah, what they can mean for specific disciplines. Um, so this is uh, the DALI 2 prompt book. So they help you design um, specific prompts to come up with um, interesting images. And it already shows you have to know a lot about photography to make an interesting um, uh, picture. Um, but the technology can also help you learn a lot about uh, photography by using it. Um, so you don't need a very expensive camera, etc., but you have to dive into the specifics of what is what what kind of lenses are used to make specific in, uh, images, like macro, telephoto, or wide-angle um, lenses, for example. Um, so maybe for photography, uh, generative AI could be seen as just another lens or another filter, just some way of making um, interesting photographs um, or, or remixing your own photographs with this kind of technology. So using technology isn't new, of course, for uh, photography students. And they will, uh, some of them will embrace this technology too. Um, uh, Beeple, maybe some of you know him, he makes a uh, digital image every day and sold his work for a uh, couple of millions. Um, so for him, the process of generate of of designing images by hand with the computer, but but by hand by um, just using Photoshop and other tools um, in an innovative way, feels a little bit old school. Like he's a painter and he thinks he will embrace AI to um, to maybe combine those skill sets, prompt design and using uh, image, uh, other uh, tr more traditional digital image uh, technologies. So filmmaking, you can make stills um, with, the, with the technology and um, let those stills be inspired by a specific type of film, for example. Um, and we're also seeing the first um, examples of moving images. So of films generated by AI. Um, and I think many students will see generative AI as a storytelling tool. So they're, if they are great storytellers, it isn't that much of a problem that there are other, that there are technologies that um, uh, make it easy to generate images because you still have to tell the story. So that's your added value as a uh, as an artist or as a professional. Um, and you can uh, embrace the technology and use the storytelling tool. 
fashion, for example. So those are all um, shoes generated by um, by generative AI. And there's also a website, this shoe does not exist.com. Um, and maybe that's also about um, finding and multiplying your own signature. So all AI images are based on existing images. Um, and you can be one if you are a famous artist, so you're in the data set of, um, uh, of those technologies. So others can use your style to, um, to make new artworks based on, on your style, your signature. Um, so maybe it becomes interesting to um, uh, develop your signature as an AI um, data set uh, and make new works of art in your own discipline or in other disciplines um, using that, that signature. So it would be maybe it becomes easier to move between disciplines um, and to uh, to work with, with other makers is if it's not that much of a problem to move from fashion to illustration, for example, um, especially when you can um, keep uh, and, uh, and take your uh, signature work with you. Illustration, so that's the, the main discipline that is named uh, by a lot of people as something that will not exist in a couple of years. No, I, I just am in doubt if that will be the case. Um, even for AI, it's hard to make uh, really interesting stories with illustrations. Um, but um, mixing an image in a specific style is very uh, Good possible with these um, uh, technologies. So maybe it will learn our illustrators that are now studying to um, to discover whether they what, what makes them human compared to that AI. So that illustration you see on the left is made by a human. So how does that differentiate from things that are made by a generative AI? Can we generate that kind of images in that specific way? Or is there something unique about a, a human approach uh, that still differentiates them from generative AI? So maybe it's, it's a nice reflection tool for our students. Product design, you can experiment with a lot of different um, materials. So putting one image or one artwork into another material. And in Utrecht, we had a, an interesting uh, speculative project that um, was about working with machines. So it's hard for a robot to do pottery. Um, and what would happen if we, we taught the robots to, to do it? Uh, and how would you approach that kind of process? So. This is an, a digital phase, for example, so you have to, um, uh, to, put, to put your, um, uh, your, your uh, you have to materialize it too. Architecture, I will maybe skip this one, um, but yeah, as a tool to teach art history, just by working with uh, this generative AI, I learned a lot about art history. So that could be interesting just as an education practice uh, within our art schools to use this technology to, um, uh, to help students uh, find inspiration uh, with other artists and artists from decades ago um, in a more um, fun way and a more creative way instead of just reading uh, the books about art history. And this is also about working together. So it maybe in the future, it won't be all about um, uh, just generating prompts. It can also be about a hybrid between painting something and then filling it in or um, uh, getting it uh, a step further with generative AI and vice versa. Um, so building on each other and really working together with the tool, with the technology. And this is one of the um, first practical uses that I found within my art school. Um, this is someone who has a similar background as me, 
thinks a lot about the future of, of, of art and society, uh, but isn't that much of a maker. Uh, he couldn't Photoshop this or he couldn't um, uh, make uh, something about materials that look like this. Um, and this, this uh, designer, this social designer, uh, was really helped by this technology to do speculative design, to imagine a future where robots and animals would merge to uh, fight climate change, for example. That was his speculative uh, story. So instead of hiring uh, many artists in the beginning of his research project, in which he didn't have any funds, he could just use this technology to express what he wanted to, to do with his research project, get the funds and then maybe um, uh, hire um, uh, makers, other makers, other designers, product designers, uh, technology designers uh, when the funds arrived. So for him, it, it became a very practical, practical tool. And then uh, to conclude with, um, maybe these technologies can also be my um, uh, a tool by itself for some of the disciplines. So it could be very interesting to be a prompt design artist, maybe even like something as poetry. So we have a uh, specialization, it's called writing for performance, so write, writing for, for theater. Um, and yeah, maybe it will, uh, the, the combination of writing and uh, images or theater will um, generate new kind of stories and uh, more efficient workflow. So the prompt is the art, was said by some of the persons in the um, Discord community of uh, Midjourney. So maybe it can be a new specialization, system designer, for example. I will skip this one. And then we have maybe an analogy with the emergence of music sampling. So music sampling was also considered as something that was not done, that replaced artists and that was a copyright infringement. But now it's very, um, very common among uh, music designers and mus musicians to, to use samples. So maybe it's, uh, it's a nice analogy to understand what would happen to both the makership and the economics of the creative field. So these are my conclusions yet, or my hypothesis uh, at the beginning of this research project. So it helps you reflect on your added value as a human or an artist, or it can help you. Um, you can use it as a storytelling tool. Um, it has always been about the combination of making something, imagining something and using some forms of technology for it, you have to put it into a medium to express yourself. So it's nothing new, just embrace the tools. Uh, maybe it can help cross boundaries between disciplines because you don't have to be an expert in every discipline. You can just mix your style into another. Um, and maybe you can look at the field of music technology uh, and look at sampling for a nice analogy to uh, understand what this impact will be of these generative technologies. Um, I don't know if there is some time for a discussion, but I'm happy to uh, to discuss with you uh, a bit further. Uh, and this also I will do in the coming years of coming months uh, uh, in relation to that research project. So how does it impact entrepreneurship? Um, and um, yeah, how those um, generative AI tools fit into the, the current workflows of our students and just graduated um, creative professionals. So that's something I will discover, but I'm also interested in how your in your opinions about this uh, this topic. Okay, grazie mille. Yes. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much for this really uh, interesting and very rich speech. We have uh, a question here from uh, one of our students and we have quite a lively chat. So. If you come here, uh, just a moment. Okay. Eccolo, prego. <laughs> uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
So um, let me put on some uh, radical critique for these um, for these new insights of technology. So what I really see missing here is the political impact of these technologies. That's really one of the key modulators of our future. And um, I would say, is it really good to um, to incorporate all these? liberal concepts here like exploitability, appropriation, um, entrepreneurship, you know, um, working for value, or is it more important to actually look into these technologies and be conscious of their political powers because these are dual use technologies, you know, like in science, there are technologies that can be used for several things and these technologies will and can be and are already used in war and also in social design of the uh, most shady figures in society. I mean, if you look in Russia, what is happening there with the social networks, with the um, design of public narratives, you know, do you really want to give these people the tools in their hand to really hack into human brains, to really um, like control each and every aspect of their lives? Um, so this is um, really a very, very pressing um, issue. And I think um, it is as important to know about these uh, political things as it is about as to know about the, all the technical issues that come with it. I think you can only make sense of it if you really um, look into the uh, political um, and social impact of these technologies and be very aware that it's a, a double-edged sword, really. Um, if you uh, bring these technologies out, people will pick them up and will do a lot of things with them. So. Um, yeah, so that's uh, for me a very, very pressing issue. And I mean, if you look into um, our role as artists and designers, I think it's very banal to say that um, originality and creativity is not something that is occupied by humans. It is not. And um, artists, uh, Western males, like people, that 100 years ago find the beauty in your artwork and abandon it because it's not worth it like beauty is not the aim anymore and to bring another example from the technologies for example in chess um, originality and creativity is the hallmark is a sign of machines not of humans anymore um, when humans play a very original and creative like chess game in the competition the judges will be actually thinking that this person is cheating somehow with machines. So at least in chess, creativity and originality are not a human hallmark anymore. It's a machine hallmark and it's a sign of, of the machine. So I am very much sure that also in the arts, this will not be something that is will be regarded as human anymore. So yeah, the question is also very much, what is our role in this whole process? So yeah, thanks. So uh, this opens uh, all uh, uh, an enormous field. So more than a question was, uh, <laughs> we'll tackle this in the next month, maybe. Uh, please, Tom, if you have just a word uh, to uh, what? Sorry, what? Uh, Stefan, Klaus, eh? Klaus. Uh, uh, to um, say something to Klaus. Yeah, I, I think that are very valid points, um, and I think that's that's a common um, uh, debate already in the academic field, maybe for the past couple of uh, couple of years. Um, and yeah, it, it it needs to be investigated. The the, uh, the good use of those technology maybe we can also play a role as an art school uh, to uh, to discuss that. Um, yeah, that that uses uh, the the good uses, the bad uses, how to cope with uh, uh, the bad uses. Uh, but it's also something that that goes beyond um, maybe what we can do as an as an art school. Um, but and that that maybe also goes beyond our control uh, when it concerns the technology itself. So the technology is available. It's available in the wild. It it will be used like any technology, like photography, like computer art of a computer of digital computers, um, for both good things and um, and the bad things. 
Um, and I think the, the most important thing as artists that we can do is reflect on, and, and even as academics, is reflect on those potential misuses and pol political structures, for for etc. For, for example, so um, I, I think that that could be a, a main task of uh, uh, some of the artists that will work with those uh, technologies. Um, but I think there are also a lot of um, makers that that don't have the time or the interest in um, reflecting on the social political structures that accompany those new technologies. So um, I, I think we'll see um, both debates uh, parallel to, to each other, the more creative potentialities and the uh, potential uh, and realistic side effects of this introduction. Okay, thank you very much, John. It, uh, it will be part of my uh, my research project to discuss those um, elements as well. Great. So I, I think there would be future occasions to discuss these points because I think they are crucial points that we have to anyhow tackle or try to uh, not to uh, be confronted with. So thank you very much, Tom. Really for uh, your speech, and we we'll have now maybe a few minutes of break. And but um, in a few minutes, 11.15, we start again with uh, Domenico Quaranta, which and 